All right. So I am Sarah Sperry. I'm an assistant professor of psychiatry and adjunct in psychology. I'm a clinical psychologist and I am primarily focused on research on bipolar disorder um, and do also have a small clinical caseload. But uh, as of last week, I'm 97% research and 90% of that is research using EMA. So um, I'm excited to be here today. I tried to gear this talk so that everyone could learn a little something, whether you are somebody who already uses EMA in your research or you've never used it before. Um, but this will be very didactic. I want to share my knowledge of what I've learned over the last 13 years doing EMA um, and, and what it means. Before I jump into the talk, I'll preface that my definition of EMA very much comes from the perspective of a psychologist, and um, and my PhD mentor was one of the first people really using EMA in psychopathology research in the United States. He went over to the Europe where they started this first and learned about it and came back. Uh, and so my definition from EMA might be different from your definition of EMA. And I welcome questions and conversation at the end uh, about uh, what this all means. So with that, I will jump in. So I'm gonna start by talking about what is EMA in the first place. Um, 13 years of experience of how to design an EMA study, taking into account uh, the phenomenon that you want to study, and then give you some examples from my own research uh, that will hopefully shed light on kind of some design considerations. Also going to put a plug for the MyTrix Symposium, and then also to throw in more names, um, the Society for Ambulatory Assessment is a very niche conference focused on using technology to measure health in the real world. So as people go about their normal daily life, um, and myself and Aiden Wright, who is also the inaugural professor of the Eisenberg Family Depression Center, are hosting this conference here at University of Michigan next summer from June 3rd to 5th. And we'll be putting out a call in the next week. Um, but if you're interested in mobile health, I definitely encourage you guys to come to that conference next summer. All right, so I'm gonna start with this quote um, that really influenced me when I first uh, took steps into this research method. Uh, this is from an annual review and it says no one is diagnosed or treated because of how they behave in a laboratory or consulting room. Yet behavior is seldom studied, assessed, or observed as it unfolds in the real world. Instead, both clinicians and researchers rely on global summary or retrospective self-reports of behavior. We ask patients how often they experience anxiety on average, how many panic attacks they had during the past week or month, how intense their pain generally is during the day, or how depressed their mood has been. Moreover, the emphasis on global assessments can keep us from seeing and studying dynamic changes in behavior over time and across situations, from appreciating how behavior varies and is governed by context, and from understanding cascades of behavior or interactions with others or with our environments that play out as a sequence of events over time. Thus, our frequent reliance on global retrospective reports seriously limits our ability to accurately characterize, understand, and change behavior in real world settings and misses the dynamics of life as it is lived day to day, hour by hour. So this quote really, um, I think has a big punch to it and emphasizes why I started pursuing this method, really wanting to understand the experience of emotions and behaviors, particularly related in my case to people experiencing um, mania and depression. So the first thing I will say today is that EMA is not a single method. It's a range of methods. EMA really represents the design of a study using technology or even paper and pencil 
to get at how people are doing, how people are behaving, what's going on physiologically for them in the moment, in their real world over time. So uh, I'm gonna break down the EMA pieces later to, to talk a little bit more about that. But I, I wanna be clear that while today I'm primarily gonna focus on smartphone EMA, EMA has been done for decades on paper and pencil. When I started grad school, we were using Palm Pilots. Some of you may not even know what those are. Um, it can be done over telephone, app, or now even watch. So to start, I'm gonna actually show you what EMA means to me. So this is um, one of my current EMA studies. Um, and this is a screenshot of me going through about a two minute EMA survey. And I just want us to go through this and then talk about the different constructs that are assessed using this EMA. Sarah, is there supposed to be sound on the video? Okay. Nope. All right, so I'm gonna pause that. All right, so in this survey, um, the goal is to assess a couple of different things. So I'm gonna go through them with you and you can think about how that matches on to some of the questions that you saw. So the first is in general, negative and positive emotions. Emotion regulation, so to what extent you're trying to change your emotions, emotional awareness, perceived stress, impulsive behavior, impulsive eating, which is a small portion of the study in collaboration uh, with Ashley Gerhardt, and social context. And so it's a combination of a lot of different items and I'm gonna talk about item selection later, that are all put together into a survey that is delivered to somebody on their smartphone and asking them, you know, right now or since the last survey, which in this study is about two hours ago, what have you done? And there are a couple of key features of this that make this an EMA versus just sending um, you know, a PHQ-9 to somebody over a, over their smartphone. PHQ-9 is the patient health questionnaire, a, a general depression questionnaire. So the key features of EMA are first, that data is collected in real world environments as individuals go about their normal lives. So it does not get counted as EMA if you're giving them surveys on a smartphone and they're sitting in the lab. 
right? So it's about them being outside of the lab, outside of the environment. The strictest definition of EMA requires that assessments focus on the individual's current state. If you ask some, you know, hardcore card-carrying EMA researchers, well, what if I send them a survey at the end of the day that asks them to rate their mood over the last day? They would call that a daily diary, which is an ambulatory assessment method, but it's not EMA. So EMA is really about the fact that you're asking about somebody right now in the moment or over a very short period of time, what's going on for them. So you're sampling a moment. And those moments need to be selected based on your features of interest. So you need to think about what behavior, emotion, health outcome am I interested in measuring? How often do I need to be asking that? How often, like, how do I get people to answer that? And does that work with EMA? And then the last key is that it's multiple repeated assessments over time. So it's not an EMA if you just send this to somebody once, okay? So those are kind of the four tenets of the, the true definition, or what I consider the true definition of EMA as it was historically developed as, you know, the creators of this method um, designed it to be. Now, why would you use this type of method versus something else? Well, it's particularly helpful for examining um, for many different things, but I would argue four primary things. Mm -hmm. First is individual differences between people as they go about their normal daily lives. Intra-individual variability, so how an individual differs from themselves over time. Contextual associations, how does the phenomenon that I want to study look in different contexts? And temporal sequences, so how do things unfold in daily life? And I'm going to give you an example of how you could narrow that down into some different questions. If I was interested in using EMA to study individual differences, I might ask the question, do people with bipolar disorder vary in terms of the percentage of time they wrote, report experiencing depressed mood? So maybe I design an EMA study where they're filling out a question about their depressed mood right now, and I give that to them over a month period. And then I want to know how do individuals differ in terms of how much time they're reporting depression. For intra-individual variability, I might ask a specific question for a specific individual with bipolar disorder, how does depression vary over time? So for that person, are they just reporting depression all the time? Is it high at certain points and not other points? Does it vacillate or do they not have depression? In terms of contextual associations, I might ask, does that look different if they're around other people or not? So in those moments when I survey them and they're around others, is their depression score different than when they're not with others? And temporal sequences. How does stress at one moment predict depressive symptoms at the next moment within that person? You'll also hear people talk about EMA being particularly helpful to think about things like within subject versus between subject questions. And put in a risk framework, you could think about this like the uh, within subject question is when is risk most acute? So at what moments in somebody's daily life am I seeing higher uh, self-reports of suicidal ideation? Is, is there something I can detect from moment to moment that puts that person at higher risk? Versus the between subjects question, which is which individuals are most at risk? So maybe I'm measuring depression and suicidal ideation in an EMA over a month, and I find out that it's um, people on antidepressants with a bipolar one diagnosis, they have patterns in daily life that look different than if they're on a mood stabilizer. So it's that between person question. Okay, let's think about how we design 
a good EMA study. And the reason why I'm going to go into so much detail here is because I think a lot of people get excited about this method of EMA and they start designing a study. And there's actually so many things you need to take into consideration at the onset that impact your results that you can draw from an EMA study that without, without having some kind of template or resource to make you think about these things, um, there can also be really bad EMA research out there. Just because it goes out into people's life doesn't mean it's good research. So I'm going to try to give you my, I guess, tips and tricks or things that I've learned over time that are critically important to doing good EMA research. I'm going to go through technology, your sampling strategy, item selection, monitoring and compliance, analysis, and reporting guidelines. So first, let's start with technology. So up here are some names of kind of the um, big names in the market of EMA software platforms. Some of these have more capabilities than just EMA and that they can also do passive sensing or other um, ambulatory methods. Um, but these are the these are the names that you'll see at least in in primarily psychological or health research that are that are very well known. Um, I have used MetricWire, ExpoWell, MindLamp, uh, TigerAware, and now my, my data helps. So I can always answer specific questions about those ones. They all have their pros and cons. Um, but a lot of these companies come and go. The ones up on this screen are ones that have had some longevity. They've been around for a while now, so I trust them. <laughs> okay, so how do you pick one of those then if there's so many? Here's some things to think about, and this is good for the mobile tech core to think about too. So the first is customer service. Some of these companies are small academic ones that come from you know, an academic interest, but don't actually have a whole lot of tech support. So what happens if an iOS or an Android update happens and it breaks the app? How many resources and how many people do they have to fix that problem right away? Because if you're in the middle of data analysis and that happens and you have 50 participants calling you being like, I'm not getting my surveys. You want to be able to tell them, yeah, there was an update. I'm sorry. You know, within 24 hours, this is going to be fixed. With some of the smaller academic companies, that doesn't happen. It can take up to weeks to, to retool the software if an update happens or if they don't have beta, you know, knowledge of what's coming in iOS. They won't know until it breaks. You're the guinea pig to find out that it breaks. So customer service is important. Second is participant number limits. So a lot of companies, their pricing structures are based on how many participants you're going to have. If you're running a study on a large medical system of thousands of participants, this is very different than your, if you're designing a study on, let's say, 150 people, a certain clinical population, and doing a more dense sampling approach. So you want to know what, what are their limits? Do they have customization options? Can you pay them to make changes to response options or scheduling or other things like that to meet your needs of your study? How expensive it is? In the old days, this used to be an incredibly cheap method. When I started graduate school just in 2014, the average price of these was about $600 a year. Now they can range up to $50,000 a year. So as a method, it's gotten a lot more expensive. So depending on whether you're a student or, you know, you have a large R01 study, uh, pricing matters. Uh, compliance and privacy. So some of the more academic apps have not gotten HIPAA approval status or in the Europe, in Europe, I forget what the regulatory name is there, but um, but they might not pass by our university's regulations, whereas others, you know, are HIPAA approved and have met all of the security requirements of your institution. 
this is a critical piece. Um, does the app work equally well on different types of devices? So there are some companies where it works a lot better on iOS than it works on Android or vice versa. And this is important because unless you're going to limit who you're doing this on to a certain type of phone user, which reduces the generalizability of your sample, you want a software platform that works equally well. And what do I mean by it doesn't work as well? Well, for example, I used ExpoWell, great app, nothing wrong with it. I did, well, there's things wrong with all of them. But during my dissertation, I used ExpoWell and it just did not work as well on Androids as iOS is. And what that looked like is more missed triggers. So when a survey was supposed to trigger, it didn't. Um, more kind of glitchiness with things not uploading to the cloud. And there's, you know, you just need to talk to people to find out what's been your experience with this, you know, this app versus that app to find out these uh, nuances. Another key is Wi-Fi versus data. Do they have to be on Wi-Fi for the data to upload to the cloud or can they do that on data? This is important because if it's Wi-Fi only, um, then you tend to see more data loss uh, if storage gets filled, like if they're not connecting to Wi-Fi for a while. So I tend to see more missingness on apps that only work on Wi-Fi. And then is it local versus cloud-based storage? These days, most of them are cloud-based storage. In the olden days, when we were using Palm Pilots, participants were coming into the lab to plug in their phones to download them locally on SERP server. So we've come a long way, but there are still some apps that function by locally saving things on the phone. All right. Sampling strategy. This is probably the most important in terms of decision making. Uh, there's this wonderful paper uh, by one of Aiden Wright's graduate students where they came up with this clever thing called the three Ds, density, depth, and duration. So for density, that's talking about the frequency of the surveys. How often are you sending them on a smartphone to people on a day-to-day -day basis? Depth is the length of the survey. How many items are you including? And duration, how many numbers of days in the protocol uh, do you need? I'm gonna start with free, uh, density. So how are you sending the surveys? How frequently and when? There are two primary methods for um, sampling schemes in terms of EMA. The first is called event contingent sampling. The second is considered time-based sampling. For event contingent sampling, this is when you have some kind of predefined event or episode that you're particularly interested in. Common psychological examples we think of are instances of drinking, impulsive behavior, eating, suicide thoughts. I saw somebody in here who's studying diabetes, so maybe a time when your insulin is low. It's a specific event where you want to know about what's going on for that person when that event happens. So you train them to say, you're going to fill out one of these surveys when this instant happens. So importantly, the individual must determine when the event has occurred and initiate an assessment, which has its limitations. And the frequency of the events matter here. If you're thinking about every time you talk out loud, well, then they'd be filling out surveys potentially every minute of every day. So you would not want to use that kind of method. Um, but for those more like lower base rate phenomenon that happen, event contingent sampling can be really helpful. Time sampling is the most common uh, sampling scheme you're going to see. And there's multiple different uh, ways you can do time sampling, which I'm going to show you next. Time sampling in general is good for phenomenon that vary continuously. So mood, pain, stress, cognition. Um, 
the two types are fixed versus variable schedules, which we're going to talk about. But here the key is, is you don't need necessarily the insight of the event to go into the survey, but you have to make sure your app has good signaling. How does it let the person know that they need to do a survey? Is it sending them a text, a push notification, an alert? Is it reliable in doing that? So here's the time options. So each line here represents 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And each of the little yellow triangles represents a signal. So this is a notification coming from the app to a person saying, fill out your survey now. So a fixed schedule is essentially, it's coming at a fixed schedule. It's the same time every day and you have equal intervals. So there's the same amount of time between each assessments, which is actually a very important um, different like distinguishing factor of, of fixed intervals. Then you have completely random. And there are certain folks who say completely random timing is the only true ecological momentary assessment. Because if you're randomly, randomly sampling moments, a random schedule is the only one that actually does that, uh, that couldn't be learned by the participant. Problem with random is that unless you have completely random, you could get like 10 surveys right in a row in the first hour and then none the rest of the day. And then obviously you're not getting great coverage of the phenomenon of interest. So what most of us end up with is what's called a semi-random scheduling, where we epoch the day into certain inter intervals and we have our programs randomly send notifications within that epoch. So we're getting coverage across the day, but the survey isn't coming at the same time every day so that we're not sampling the same context every day. We're trying to get different instances and contexts by varying the time that the notification is sent. And then lastly, was that event contingent? So when something happens, I'm gonna fill it out. Some people do a combination of semi-random and event sampling, which can be a good strategy because event sampling alone, you're gonna have to do that for much longer likely to be able to get enough instances of that event to have statistical power. So some people will combine those two so they can get you know, momentary assessments and event-driven assessments. So that's all a lot. How do you actually balance density, depth, and duration? You have to think about a couple of different things. First, what is it that you're studying? So what's your phenomenon of interest and what are its base rates? If you're studying something like negative and positive affect, that's continuous and you're going to get ratings no matter when you sample it. So the when maybe matters a little less. If you're interested specifically in negative and positive affect as it relates to uh, sleepiness or wakefulness, maybe you're most interested in measuring that early in the day and later in the day. If you're interested in drinking, maybe you want more sampling on weekends than you want on weekdays. If you're interested in suicidal ideation, that might be more continuous and chronic depending on your sample. But if you're interested in suicidal behavior, that's such a low base rate that you're probably going to have to have a much longer study to capture enough instances of it. So your density, depth, and duration is, is very much determined by what your research question is and what phenomenon you're studying. The second consideration that uh, is very important is who is your population? If you're doing this on college students, you can up the density, up the depth, at depth up the duration and not really worry about seeing too much compliance drop. They kind of do a lot of it and you could push their limits. If you're doing a clinical population, so say in my studies of bipolar disorder, I reduce the density, the depth and the duration 
to reduce burden on my participants and enhance the quality of the data I get when I get it. If you are doing it on adolescence versus adults, you might also think about the fact that they're in school during the day and have certain structural constraints that's gonna influence your sampling scheme. Um, so a lot of adolescent studies will sample in the morning before school, after school, and then before bed, but then up the number of samples over the weekend, and they'll do like eight samples a day on the weekend. So again, who you're studying, what you're interested in is going to determine what sampling scheme you use. And the last is, is you want to know how you're going to analyze the data first because that also influences your sampling strategy. If you're interested in variability within a day, well, then you need to have more than th th three minimum um, measures that day, because you can't really study, like a, a standard deviation from one point to the next is not really that meaningful. You want at least three measures. Well, if you take into consideration that people on average miss two per day, then maybe you want five surveys a day. If you're interested in studying the autocorrelation of phenomenon, how much like carryover you get from one moment to the next, you know, how long does stress impact negative emotions for the rest of the day? Well, then you're going to need more measures over the day to have a higher confidence in that autocorrelation estimate. If you're interested in an instability of a phenomenon, again, I'm going to say probably at minimum five measures a day. But if you're just thinking, oh, I want to sample it twice a day, and you're just looking at mean levels, then that's fine. But if you design your study and then later are like, oh, I really want to look at intra-individual variability, but you've only done two time points, it's not gonna work. So you wanna think about the statistical analysis as well. This is an important point. While all of us originally thought that density and depth, so again, length of the survey and how frequently you're asking people to fill it out related most to compliance, it's actually duration. So you can up the number of items, you can up the number of assessments per day, you can double them. And in general, you see a very small amount of degradation and compliance. But if you take it from seven to 14 days or 14 days to a month, you see a huge drop in compliance. So it's about how long the study is. People are willing to do really dense sampling for a short period of time. But as you get longer and longer, your compliance is going to go closer and closer to about 50%. All right, item selection. How do you choose those items in your EMA survey? I would say the field's current standard is, oh, let me take a validated item from a questionnaire that we already have and just put right now in front of it. And to be honest, that's how a lot of these items were created. But we've learned over time that that doesn't always work well. Um, so you want to choose, I, you want to dive into the literature. You want to look at what items other people have used. Um, have they gotten good variants in the item? What are the psychometric properties of the item? You know, are they hugely zero and inflated? Um, you know, does it correlate with the things that I'm interested in? You don't want to just take a random item and put right now in front of it. You also need to think about response options. So you saw in my questionnaire that I primarily use a Likert scale. I usually use one to seven in general, not at all to very much on my continuous ratings. Um, there's been several studies that have looked at different length, uh, different Likert options from, you know, one to five, one to seven, one to 10, one to 100. One to seven seems to be kind of optimal for getting enough variability in the item itself, but also that people feel like there's a meaningful difference between the options. A lot of people use a visual analog scale, which is like zero to 100, where they're sliding the bar um, across. 
problem with that method that we're increasingly seeing is you're getting um, a kind of biased inflation at the middle because it's just easier for people to tap on the middle um, and less kind of meaningful variability because as they slide it from left to right, like what's the difference between a 97 and a 92? Uh, is that really meaningful? Um, some people though really like visual analog scales. They'll, you know, defend it um, and that's their right. You'll see some people use grids. So like tap on the screen where that reflects how you're feeling. They'll do pictures or there can be free text or integers. Um, so you can combine these methods, but I would say the most common and most successful tried and true is a Likert scale for your questions. This is a resource I encourage you all to look at. It's called the ESM Item Repository. Um, fun fact, EMA is called Experiencing Sampling, Experience Sampling Methodology pretty much everywhere else in the world. Um, when it first became a thing, it was called ESM. Um, the United States has seemed to adopted the term EMA more so, but they're the same thing. So, the ESM item repository is an initiative to create validated items for EMA scales. And so it's on OSF and it also has its own website. And it's a bank of questions that have been published before across various content areas with the response options, how frequently they were administered. Um, they have different languages. Uh, this is housed from the Center of Contextual Psychiatry at KU Leuven, um, who's done a lot of the seminal EMA work. And so there is a lot of Dutch and German in there, but it all has English translations. And you can submit your items to this after you publish them as well. So this is a growing resource that I use and, and I always encourage people to look at if they're starting a new EMA study and they want to find validated items. All right, so monitoring and compliance. Um, I encourage daily monitoring. So again, this is in the context of a study where you're doing dense sampling, you're measuring them every day, you know, multiple times a day. In my lab, we have a policy if somebody misses 24 hours of surveys, we reach out to them and give them a quick nudge. Um, we find that that can, catch technology issues, or if somebody's accidentally turned off notifications on their phone, um, things like that. So we have a little uh, method for, for catching that. I've run probably close to 3,000 people through EMA protocols now, and my compliance ranges from 68 to 95%. Um, and the median in there would probably be about 75%, which is pretty consistent with the general literature. So those, uh, that's what you can expect. So when I do a priori power analysis, I always put in 75% compliance um, in those power analyses. Things that I've found contribute to better compliance, an app that works better on the phone, if people get frustrated with the app you're using or find it confusing, you get lower compliance. Compensation. Um, I get about 75% compliance without paying undergrads, but clinical populations, that's not gonna work. We compensate $1 per survey. Now our surveys tend to be around 20 items, so they're on the longer side. And then we do a bonus structure. So if you say, you know, you're going to complete more than 80 questionnaires a week, you're going to get a $5 bonus. Uh, the bonus method works nicely. Um, and then the second thing is, is I'd argue that you need to do good training. Our information sessions at the start of the study involve doing practice surveys with folks, giving them the opportunity to ask questions about the questions, we have them do the whole system from start to finish. They get a text, have to open the app, 
click on the questionnaire, complete it, get out. So that level of kind of hand-holding the beginning definitely does make a difference. When I haven't done it, I'm closer to the like 60 range. When I do do it, I'm closer to the 80 range. All right, analysis. So this data is different than your general survey data because you have multiple observations of that survey. So they're, they're by definition correlated and nested within an individual. So you can't just go and do an ANOVA, or if you do, that's really sad because you're aggregating across very rich data that could be explored in better ways. If you're not using a fixed schedule, you need to remember that the distances between your responses are not necessarily uniform. And this is important for some of the analytic methods that we use and that you're gonna have a lot of missingness. And it's important to think about, is my mi missingness due to technology failures? So when I've had those experiences where an update comes to iOS and I get a slew of people reporting that the app's not working, I make sure I have a system of documenting whether that missingness is due to technology, uh, if I know for sure that that's what's happening. But you can also look at things like is missingness correlated with certain psychological variables I care about? Is it associated with, um, you know, whether somebody has an iPhone or an Android, you can look at these things after the fact. And that's important to explore before um, starting your analysis. So for those who haven't collected this type of data before, as opposed to getting just you know, a questionnaire, you need to think about your data as a time series. So this is a random selection of participants. This is their high arousal negative emotions plotted over 14 days. In this study, they were sampled eight times a day. And so I need to think about this in terms of what do I want to know about the time series, not just what do I want to know about a mean level of, um, you know, negative mood. So how might I do that? Well, if I take these three people and I look at them more in depth, I might ask a couple of different questions of this time series. My between person question might be which individuals are at risk? And so maybe I'm gonna look at their mean levels of, of negative uh, emotions. Well, for these three individuals, their means are actually the same. So I would say nobody is at greater risk than another if that was the metric I was using. Now, maybe I'm more interested in how much they vary from their mean or the amplitude of their time series. Here we see the first individual and the third individual have a lot more variability than the second individual. So maybe it's those people who have greater variance that are more at risk. Or I ask a within-person question, when is a person at risk? So this third person here, um, if you've ever been to one of my talks before, I always show this slide because it's so perfect. Um, you look and you see generally they don't have a lot of negative emotions except for these two spikes. And when you actually go into the data and look at the days, you find that actually their negative mood is really high on the weekends. So this person seems to be at risk on weekends only. So that's how we could take a time series and look at a within person question about risk. Now, how do we do that? How do we you know, examine things at individual levels and between person levels accounting for time? There's lots of different methods out there. The most simple one is, is multi-level modeling. You're pretty much always going to need to use some multi-level framework because, again, these observations are nested within an individual. And then there's also methods that start to incorporate things like time series analysis or network analysis to start to disentangle temporal relationships between variables over time. So I listed um, some that I've used before. Um, of note, Gimme was, um, you know, coined by two people we have here now at University of Michigan, Aiden Ray and Adrian Belts. 
Um, so there's a lot of, of, of cool models out there that can start to disentangle this data to look at within and between person relationships and the temporal dynamics of, of variables over time. Okay, almost done. Um, there's this great article that I encourage all of you guys to take a look at before you publish on EMA data. So this is an article that talks about suggested reporting guidelines for EMA questionnaires, um, justify sample size, explain rationale for your sampling design, your sampling density, the technical details of your sampling, the full text of your items, the psychometric properties of your items, the hardware and software used, uh, missing data and descriptive statistics around that missingness, uh, procedures used to enhance compliance, the total number of observations of your final data set, how you centered variables, and how you considered time. So they have a nice table there that will help kind of break down what information to include. And with that, I was going to just show a couple of examples of studies, but all of these are pretty much the same. In general, I do eight prompts a day, semi-random intervals, seven to 14 days. Most of my surveys range from about 20 items to 28 items at the longest. Um, and uh, I use what's called like a bag of items approach. So I'm taking certain validated items and in general, often trying to identify factors that I can use to study a construct. So the items load together into a positive affect factor, irritability, dysphoria, so on and so forth. So I want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to kind of run through these. Um, and um, just Lastly, talk about a quick approach that I think is helpful for people to know, which is a measurement burst design. So let's say you want to measure something over a long period of time using EMA, but you know that people aren't going to do it every day for a year. You could do something called a measurement burst design where you do a dense sampling in a certain amount of time over time. So in this current study that I'm doing, they do a seven week EMA protocol once per month for 12 months. So they're not doing it for the whole month, but they're doing some dense sampling for a shorter period of time over a longer period of time. And that seems to work pretty well for compliance. All right. And I will leave the last couple, five minutes of questions. I also wanna say, I have a hard stop at 1.30 because I have to go to the airport, but if people have follow-up questions for me, feel free to email me, happy to answer them. Um, and I will. Okay, okay. This, is, this is a really interesting talk. And I have a question. Uh, are you gonna share the slides or something? Do you want the slides uh, back up? I think he yes, asked if we were gonna share the slides. So yes, we will be sending yes. it out um, to everyone in this group. Um, so you'll have access yeah, yeah. to that and as well as the recording. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your talk. It was interesting. Um, Sarah, I do see a question in the chat. Um, do you find differential compliance among clinical populations versus controls, or during times when symptoms are increased, like a depressive episode? Yeah, great question. Um, I will say that that varies highly. Um, I don't know if I can give you an answer of the field in general, because I would say a lot of us have very different answers to that. In my own research, I actually have better compliance in my clinical population than I did in my undergrads, but that could simply be because I was, I pay them more. Um, my current studies, which are individuals with bipolar one, two, or kind of like a sub-threshold diagnosis, Right now, my median compliance in my protocol, which is 17 items four times a day, uh, is like 89%, but that's the highest I've ever had in a clinical population. Um, you 
do you see a slight drop off during depression? Um, and I don't have a good enough answer for mania yet because I don't have enough instances of when people become manic during the EMA protocol <laughs> to answer that. Um, but in general, like, unless it's a pretty severe depression, we don't like, we don't see mild depression impacting compliance much. Thank you. Uh, maybe there's time for one more question if anyone has any other questions. Okay, well, um, thank you so much, Sarah. That was really interesting. I think really helpful, gave us a great overview. Um, Victoria, did you have anything else you wanted to share with the group? Otherwise we can. Yeah, I just put in the chat that many of the companies that you listed, the technology companies, we did a, a project where we did um, vendor demos. And so we'll share in the after um, on the agenda and also um, in the email follow-up after the meeting, if anybody wants to watch the vendor demo meetings or um, there's a summary spreadsheet that we'll share a link to. So I appreciate you bringing that up, Sarah. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, the Our next meeting will be on November 13th. It's right after the metric symposium, which is November 10th, and we're going to be debriefing the symposium, um, having a nice discussion on what was covered, key highlights, and Kathy Goldstein will be leading us in that session. Thank you all. Thank Have you a so safe much. flight, Sarah.